I think out of this series, this might be my favorite question, but I would definitely say it probably is the most important question for you and I. And it's the question Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? Who do you say I am? All of us have questions as we're growing up about our identity. And maybe there's been times when you have mistaken someone's identity. Um, This last week, I was in the grocery store, I was at Brookshire's, and, and when I see people out of context, out of the place that I normally see them, it completely throws me off. And I was walking into Brookshire's, I was in the produce section, and I saw someone who goes to our church, I don't even remember at this point who it was, um, but they had a cap on, and at first I walked by and I was like, wait, I know you, I, I know you, and it just didn't occur to me the second I saw him who it was. And then once I realized, it was like, ah, I, I'm sure you've had moments like this. There was another time where I was having a conversation with someone, and for some reason, I'm sure I was working on very little sleep or something like that, I was thinking it was his best friend whose wife was going through cancer treatments. And I started asking him about his best friend's wife. Thankfully, he knew. But it didn't occur to me until I had walked away Wait, that wasn't actually him. I think it covered itself because he is so close to that family. But my guess is you've had those moments where you've mistaken someone's identity. Probably one of my favorite movies ever um, is a movie that revolves around the story of a guy named Frank Avignel. Um, This is his picture now. Um, You probably would know him because his part was played in the movie by Leonardo DiCaprio. Um, Catch me if you can. Right? Everyone, a lot of people have seen that, that movie. But at the age of 16, he ran away from home. And over the next five years, he posed as an airline pilot a doctor in a children's hospital, and a lawyer, even passing the bar exam. He flew over two and a half million miles for free and wrote over two million dollars in hot checks, all concealing his identity. And his story is fascinating. If you go and listen, he has about an hour-long lecture he gave at Google. If you get bored um, and you like lectures, um, YouTube, um, Frank Avignel, Google Talk, it is a phenomenal story because he talks about the, the fact that he was just a kid trying to survive, trying to figure out how to make it in the world, doing whatever he could to survive. And, and he was changing that identity. But, but so much of our life from a very early age, from the time we're born until really we die, revolves around the question, who am I? Right, right. Jesus asked that question of his disciples, who do you say that I am? But the question that we deal with every single day is, who am I? But before we can answer that question, who am I? We must first answer Jesus' question, who do you say I am? Because that question shapes and frames everything else about us. Because we ask that question, who am I? There's a lot of answers. I am the son of Robert and Linda. I am the husband of Cammie. I'm the father of Gracie, Ryan, Caleb, and Kaylee. I am the brother of Amy. There, there are so many things. I'm an employee of Shiloh. I'm a minister at Shiloh. 
There are so many things that shape and form our identity. Who am I? But before we get to that question, we must answer this question. Who do you say I am? Mark, in his gospel, really centers around this question. Go, go back there, just a second. Who do you say I am? Mark is going to spend his entire gospel trying to make sure you're certain of the answer to this question. And the way the book of Mark works, it's really in three different sections. And each section has an anchor story. So the first section is Mark 1, 8 through 33, and it centers around the baptism of Jesus, where God himself speaks to the identity of of Jesus as he comes out of the water and he speaks in this voice, this is my son, I love him and I am pleased with him. In the second section, it, transfiguration is kind of that anchor story where the voice from the cloud speaks again to the identity of Jesus. This is my son, listen to him. And then the third section of the cross again as an anchor story, speaks to the identity as the centurion says, surely this was the Son of God. So Mark's entire gospel is centered around this question, who is Jesus? Who do you say I am? And so in Mark chapter 8, this is kind of that center section with the transfiguration. It says, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. You are Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. You are the one we have been waiting for. You are are Messiah. And this word Messiah is used eight times in Mark's gospel. The very first time is used in the very first lines that he writes in his gospel. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. That's how he begins. And the rest of his gospel is helping you to see the answer to this question. It's to open your eyes to the truth that Jesus is the promised Messiah who has come to bring redemption into the world. And so when Peter answers this, this is only the second time the word Messiah shows up in Mark's Gospel. It shows up in one in the very first sentence, the very first words he utters, and it does not happen again until Jesus is on the road. He's on the road to Caesarea Philippi. He's standing there around these pagan temples, and he asks them, who do people say I am? And one by one, they start to answer Maybe Elijah, maybe one of the prophets, maybe John. And then Jesus turns and I think just stares right at them. That's great. But what about you? Who do you say I am? 
And of course, it's Peter who speaks out, you are Messiah. Now, when when Peter says that, he has all of these images in his head of the implications of that statement. You are Messiah. You are the chosen one. You are the valiant king, the valiant warrior. You are going to be the one that conquers Rome. You are going to sit on your throne. You are going to bring a sword. You are the one who will save God's people. He has these images in his mind of Messiah as the conquering king. And so he says, you are Messiah. And then immediately, verse 31, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. And for Peter, and I believe the rest of the disciples, there is this disconnect. Like, wait, 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 wait. Messiahs don't die. Kings who are kings who die are no longer kings. Messiahs don't die. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Right? This is not what he imagined. This is not what he thought Messiah would be. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Right? There, there was this disconnect for Peter and for the other disciples because what they pictured and what they assumed Messiah was going to do and be wasn't adding up to what Jesus was saying. And Peter says, no, we will stand up and fight for you. I think 100%, this is why Peter pulls out the sword. Like, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take a stand, and we're going to make sure you become king. We're in this with you no matter what. But what Peter did not understand, What Peter could not see, I think, is something that you and I struggle to see as well. That the way of the cross, that the way of Jesus, is an invitation to come and die. It is an invitation to come, lay down your life, to find life. That the true victory of God is not found in power and might. It's not found in a sword. But it's found in death. And the victory of God is accomplished through a humble servant laying down his life for his brothers and sisters to find life in death. And and as I said, this story of Mark takes place in three different groupings. 
the baptism of Jesus, the transfiguration, and the cross. But here in the center section of the transfiguration, he does something really, really interesting. Go to the next, yeah. Um, no, back. He, he begins this section with a story of a blind man, a blind man at Bethsaida. Jesus takes a blind man who is begging and crying out. He leads him outside the city. And it says he spits on his eyes and touches him. And he asks him, can you see? And his response is, is strange. Because he says, I see people walking around, but they look like trees. There's only this partial regaining of his sight. And so he touches him again, and then he sees clearly. And I think it's Mark telling this powerful story of the disciples' journey to see who Jesus is. Because the next story is Peter's confession that Jesus is Messiah. Right? They're starting to see. But they don't see real clearly yet. Because they don't grasp what Messiah actually means and what he's here to do. They can see, but not fully. And then the section ends with another story about blind Bartimaeus, who's calling out along the roadside. And everyone's telling him to be quiet, but he's yelling, this is King David. This is the son of King David, which is a messianic term. He's basically saying, hell to the Messiah. And everyone says, no, 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 be quiet. And Jesus says, no, go get him and bring him here. And he says, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And Jesus says, your faith has healed you. And it's the instant he realizes this is Messiah. That he's healed. Right? There's this progression for the disciples of they can see but not fully. Now they're starting to get it. Now what's really cool is the very next story in Mark's Gospel. Jesus is walking into Jerusalem. And they are lining the streets with palm branches. And the crowds are shouting, Hosanna, 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 as Jesus comes into the city. For his ordination. To sit on his, his throne. That is a cross. To be crowned as king of the Jews. With thorns that pierce his brow. And that question, who do you say I am, has really big implications for you and I 
as well. Because for the disciples to answer that question meant that we're willing to follow Jesus along the road to Calvary. And we're willing to lay down our life for Him. And after Jesus dies, is raised and returns, one by one, each of those disciples will lay down their life give their life because they believe that Jesus is Messiah. They're willing to pay the ultimate price because they are certain that the one they saw hanging on a tree rose from the dead. Because they are certain that they saw the living Christ. And that question is every bit as powerful today as it was then. Who do you say I am? Who do you say and believe that Jesus is? Because the answer to that question changes everything about us. Maybe most importantly, the question who am I? Because if we get the first question right, it completely transforms the second question. It transforms the question and it changes everything. Because now my life is not about me. My life is the answer to the call to come and die. To come and lay down my life. To come and sacrifice what I hold most dear for the kingdom. And every single day, every single day when we wake up, that first question must form and shape the second question. Because there is a part of me every single day that wants to do exactly what I want to do. I want to eat my french fries. I want to hold on to what's mine. And I want to take care of me. And I don't want to worry about anyone else. And my kingdom vision becomes so limited until I get the first question right. Who do you? Who do you say I am? See, it's not a question you just answer one time. It's a question you must answer every single day. But I believe it is a question that has the power to transform and change your life forever. Father, thank you so much for this time. God, we'll, we're so grateful for the opportunity to be here today. We're so thankful for the ways that you bless us. Father, in spite of all of the times that we have failed, all of the times we failed to understand who you are 
in the implications of our belief. So, Father, once again, meet us here. Transform us. Change us. Make us more like Jesus, your Son. Because it is in Him and Him alone that we have life. Thank you for Jesus, the Messiah, our Lord and our Savior. And we all said together, Amen.